Welcome to the latest, uh, what do we call it, Corporate Leaders series here. I'm Evan Davis. I'm no longer the presenter of Newsnight. It says that on the uh, biography. I'm about to become the presenter of PM on Radio 4. Um, we don't do sort of public and private, public and private um, sort of grandees of the state in the way that the French do. But if we did, Sir Howard Davis would be the kind of the typical example. But we don't, so he's a rather unique animal in um, British uh, life. Uh, having sort of spanned public and private corporate government uh, in many roles, um, HMT, FCO, CBI, GKN, BOE, FSA, LSE, now RBS, and I missed the ones that couldn't be put into letters like McKinsey, Phoenix Insurance, and the National Theatre. Um, his, uh, his, his interests span very widely. I'm actually a great admirer of a, something he was chairman of. I don't think you are still chairman, the Employers Forum on Age? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm chairman of something called Work. No, it doesn't. No, it was a kind of early pioneer in thinking about how we don't waste people's talent when they reach what they hope will be an early retirement at 55 and then just throw them on the... Uh, Retirement thing. He's the man responsible for airports uh, policy, the airports commission. I don't know how we got time to chair the uh, Man Booker Prize jury in 2007 because that's actually quite a big time commitment. But he's been chairing RBS since 2015, and uh, what a challenge that bank has been for all of us. Um, we bought shares at five pounds. They're worth about half of that now, rather less than half of that now, um, and. Um, the British government still owns 62% of it. I will pass on any obvious Halloween jokes about RBS this evening. Uh, what is going to happen is I will talk to uh, Howard for 25 minutes or so. I will open up to questions from the floor. We'll have an hour in all. I should tell you that this is not on Chatham House rules. This is an open, on-the-record meeting. We encourage you both to turn your phones onto silent, but then to use the phones to tweet the most interesting lines that uh, come out of what Howard says. Um, use the hashtag CHEvents, and um, we will span a bit more widely than just RBS, because Howard is a man with many opinions on many issues, and so we will span into those two. But look, let's start on RBS, um, Howard, because it is obviously quite a big thing for the UK to have taken the stake in this bank. This is a question that you might normally ask at the end, but I'm going to ask at the beginning. Just tell me where you think this bank is going to be in 10 years' time. What, what, what is the sort of vision of what, what is it going to look like in 10 years' time? Um, in 10 years' time, I think it'll um, look like a fintech company um, because I think that is the way banking is going. Um, the growing banks are all digital-only banks. Um, we are wrestling with the legacy of a large branch network, as the other big banks are here. But if you look at the way people are managing their finances, they're managing them increasingly online, on their mobiles. And I think that the future for all banks is really going to be uh, to devise neat and clever um, digital interfaces. Now, I think that they may also, um, the banks that survive and succeed will be ones that are useful to their customers. In other words, uh, acting probably as intermediaries for their customers in acquiring other things, both other financial products, but maybe other products as well. You're increasingly seeing banks getting into that position. Um, so, you know, we have an advantage and we've got 18 million customers and we know quite a lot about their finances. And in fact, we don't really exploit that knowledge very much at all. Um, now, of course, the danger is that you exploit it in a way that customers don't like. But if you can exploit it in a way that customers find helpful to them in managing their expenditure, then I think there is a future for that. If you look at the, you know, the fastest growing bank in the UK at the moment is Monzo. Monzo is actually, really its trick is that it 
for young people, it tells you your spending all the time in a le on a real time basis. How many people here have a Monzo card actually? Monzo account. Yeah. So the rest of you That's really should right. get one. Yeah. Really <laughs> have you got one? Uh, I haven't. No. <laughs> um, I, the, the, some of our, some of the people some of our people have because we're looking at what we can do. You know what? How useful it is. <laughs> but I've sort of felt that might be slightly. Dis disloyal. <laughs> so I'm afraid I have a but, but okay, I have a so kids card. A is that what I'm supposed to have? But but but, but, but um, so we're looking at a bank that is focused on retail primarily. I mean, still have an investment bank. Oh, um, well, no, I don't think it, I don't think retail because I, I I was sort of answering on the retail side, yeah. if you like. But you know, we're still we still have about 25 percent of the corporate finance market in the in the UK, and um, we're the largest, still the largest uh, corporate finance. And I think that that area is probably more defensible than the retail area. Defensible in the sense of, you know, more sustainable, if you like. Because, well, no, although actually if you go to China, you discover that the people who are really banking the sort of SME sector in China are in fact Ali, Alibaba and Tencent. And uh, the reason that they do is that they've got sort of algorithms which are the basis for their lending decisions. And what do you know, they've got very low uh, non-performing loans. In fact, almost no defaults. And why do you think that is? It's not because the algorithms are better. No, but what does Alibaba also do? It collects data and everything else. Yeah, and it also is a basically where you buy and sell. Right, right. And so if you do not repay your loan to Alipay or Alibaba, you then you are removed from their platform, <laughs> which means you're finished anyway. <laughs> so, um, you know, on the whole, that means that rather than right. being the bank where you're the, possibly the last person they'll repay, because they'll think maybe you'll forgive them for a while, um, you know, whereas you will keep on paying your suppliers and your distributors, Alibaba's both. Uh, so that's quite that's quite clever. But I think for in the in the SME sector, the larger SME sector, and indeed the, the sort of middling you know corporates, I think knowledge of the customer and understanding of the business yeah. model is something which I believe has got quite a bit of value to it. Yeah. So I think that that is a defensible uh, position. Now you know, it, it's being eaten away at the edges by peer-to-peer -peer lenders. But I, I, I suspect that there is a core there of expertise which will, will survive in that area. But I think that the retail area will be, will be yeah. digital. Yeah. And, and so branches, it, it, like the public, have basically had to just get used to the idea that checks are going. Even though you might love them, they're, well, they're not going to be here. Well, thing and branches is but another, branches. I'd say. I mean, checks, I think, is a, is a, is a yeah. pretty dead technology. There's no particular reason for that to exist anymore. Um, branches, I think, are a bit different because, you know, they're, they're, I think branches can be repurposed and that's, I think, I think they'll be fewer, but I think they'll be actually more useful. I mean, a branch that is basically just an ATM in the dry is not really very useful. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, whereas if you, can, if you can turn a branch into something that does actually have uh, financial advice and does more sophisticated things for you, then I think there will be still branches. I think probably not as many as there are now. I mean, you've raised a lot of interesting issues there. People may want to pick some of those up. Let's just go back over the last few years, because it's been a long and painful turnaround. You are in profit, and you actually paid a dividend um, this year. The, was that turnaround in the end, with hindsight, I know it's much easier with hindsight, was that turnaround longer and more painful than it needed to be? If we, if we knew what we knew now, could we have honed in on a more focused strategy straight away, do you think? Um, I think if you look back, it, it, it has been a game of two halves, the um, RBS turnaround, in the sense that there was a period between the bailout and the end of 2008 and about the end of 2013, when the bank was attempting to be a global bank still and also it, it, to, to have a substantial investment banking presence. And the reason I think that, was, that choice was made, which was made with the agreement of the principal shareholder at the time, was that if you remember, the, in the crisis, you know, 2008 was a catastrophe and 2009 was possibly even worse, except that the central banks were bailing people out and pumping money into the system. But actually, 2010 for investment banking was a good year. 
Now, that was partly, and people, you know, investment banks were criticised because it was partly because money was so cheap that they could hardly kind of fail to make money, if you like. But so there was a, what, what actually then turned into a kind of false dawn for investment banking in 2010, 2011. And that, I think, encouraged uh, the RBS management and the shareholder um, to believe that it was possible to keep this bank in its previous shape and to compete effectively across a broad front. And then the investment banking market turned down again very severely in 2012. That affected everybody. I mean, actually, I was on the board of Morgan Stanley at the time. I was at the LSE, running the LSE, but that meant my part-time, I just, you know, as a non-exec on Morgan Stanley. And, you know, if you look, the Morgan Stanley share price went from sort of 65 bucks to six in 2008. And then it went back up to 20-something in 2010, 11, and then went back down in 2012 to $12 again. Right. And, you know, so that was Morgan Stanley, which is, you know, with Goldman Sachs, really the top of the, top of the heap in this business, and remains so. And it wasn't short of smart people. Uh, it, you know, it really was not. And, and yet it, it, it found that that was a catastrophe in 2012-13. And at that point, the fact that RBS was not Goldman Sachs and it was not Morgan Stanley and it was, you know, it wasn't able to attract the people of the right sort of caliber meant that its investment bank in many markets was, you know, number five in a field of three. And that wasn't a great place and to be. And there was overcapacity in investment banking. And overcapacity. So someone had to go. And, and quite a few people, yeah, uh, yeah. Just, you know, had to pull out at that point. Um, and also the global transaction services, which was essentially the thing that was left from the ABN AMRO acquisition, was also subscale, really. And that it, feigned, it was competing with JP Morgan, Citibank, and HSBC. Now, that's a tough thing to tough three to compete with on global transactions and cash management, etc. And so a decision was made in 2013, uh, you know, to pull out of all of that. Yeah. Ross McEwen comes in. That's right. And, like and refocus, refocus the focus, bank focus, on the focus. British Isles. Smaller, smaller. So if you yeah. said now, you know, could you have foreseen all of that? Could you have foreseen that development in 2009 and made some of those decisions earlier? Well, possibly. But I'm not sure how fruitful that is to kind of go back and say, you know, that would have been... Yeah, you, you struggle. I mean, one of the other great debates... Well, look, you have a financial crisis. Everybody goes on deck to try and sort of weather the storm. Get through the storm. You're all absolutely relieved. You're so relieved. You don't write down what you've learned about how to cope in a storm. So help us write this one down, because one of the great debates was whether RBS should have been split into a good bank and a bad bank. The good bank shoved out, told, go and, you're well capitalised, go and get on with the uh, business of lending and making the economy work. Um, don't have a, any government in your... Don't have a government shareholder. Uh, and then we'll keep... The government will keep a much bigger share of the bad bank, which will just be there, really, to sort of wind down all the, the rubbish, that, the legacy stuff. Now, in retrospect, that was a, it was a very live debate, and I, I think the, 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 you know, the, the experts, I think, thought it would have been much better to split the bank into good and bad, or a lot of the experts did. Well, some, uh, but I mean, I, I think that this is a bit of an odd debate, really, because the first question, which was the one we were just discussing, was what businesses do you, did you want to be in? What was the bad bank? I know, was the investment bank a bad bank or not? Now, it wasn't thought to be a bad bank. It was thought to be still a viable. And we still do have, actually, a, a profitable, well, modestly profitable, um, smaller investment bank doing, uh, you know, foreign exchange um, financing and, and rates. And we still have that. So the, I think the, the prior question was, what is the bad, the bad bank? As soon as you'd made the decision in 2013 that you were in these businesses and going out of those businesses, then there was an internal bad bank. And that bad bank was managed in actually quite effectively and quite efficiently. And those assets were, were sold off. So I think this debate about a bad bank is a bit sort of confusing, really. And it, it assumes that you knew exactly what a bad bank was in 2009 <laughs> and what the bid, you know, which bits were good and which bits were bad. And I don't think that takes, was at all obvious. four years to, uh, to, to yeah. work that out, yeah. Um, let's move to to London and the financial sector here, because 
am I right in thinking there's this, not, not a sniff, a smell about it, but there's a sort of, there's a, perhaps a feeling or perception mm. that we've been just a little bit too open to making money with some rather unsavoury friends. I mean, RBS, there was a, uh, last year was caught up in this um, global laundromat thing and uh, money coming from Russia, banks not asking sufficient questions, people just basically being too keen to take the cash. Um, and not I, it doesn't look like that to me, I have to say. I mean, the, this, this the supposed laundromat thing, where's that gone as a story? I mean, I, you know, I don't think anyone found that anything really. I mean, you know, the Danske Bank have had a problem, but that was sort of in, a, in, in Estonia. The Americans have been, you know, very keen to get people for money laundering. But on the whole, the people who've been done has actually been on sanctions busting. And that's very tricky because the Americans have got one view of sanctions and everybody else has got a different view of sanctions on things like Iran. And I don't think that if you look at British banks, and by that I mean banks that are either British banks or banks regulated in the UK, so UK subsidiaries of foreign banks, there's not been a massive incidence of uh, money laundering, actually. There have been one or two money laundering cases where people have been fined, but almost entirely, well, entirely, on systems and controls issues, not actual money laundering, not that we found this money that went to this drug dealer or whatever. It's that you couldn't prove that you had done all the procedures and all your suspicious transaction reports have been filed and you get fined for that. So I, I honestly you don't, don't you think don't so. Really? I don't think so. And the money, anti-money laundering procedures are amazingly burdensome in this country. Okay. We are spending hundreds and hundreds of millions well, of pounds. Well, I mean, it's hard them. for, you, you know, your mum and dad to get a, to split their yeah. joint account into separate yeah. ones. But that's why it's so odd that we have so much Russian money in London, and yet well, mum and dad can't sort of get, re rejig their accounts. Most of it's in the British banking system. I honestly don't. I mean, most of it's in property. Right. Um, so would it know. be right to say that you, 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 maybe the Brits have been a little bit too open to... to, to I, I think so, I mean, I'm sort of defending the banking system here, and I would say that our banking system, in terms of its anti-money laundering controls and the way they're administered in this country, is as tough as you'll find. It's extremely expensive and it's very tough. And if you look at you know the incidence of people being prosecuted and fined for anti-money laundering, you know it's not been primarily in London. In fact, very rarely been in London actually. Uh, as for whether London economy as a whole right. okay, um, so is a useful. different kind of it's thing, perhaps, um, and maybe we, you know, but but we've been quite keen to attract foreign investment right. into. And the unexplained, the, the fact that we hadn't used unexplained wealth orders, maybe we're beginning to use them yes. now. That's not the same as saying we haven't detected money laundering because unexplained That's wealth right. is not the yeah. same as money it's laundering. Not. So so you're allowed to take money from unexplained wealth. Well, <laughs> depending on, you know, yeah. you do have to ask people where their money well, comes the money from, as comes you will from. know if you try to open a bank account. But you can say, I'm a Russian, I can say, well, I sold my shares in this company. I don't have to say how I got the shares in the company. Uh, no, that's probably, that's probably true, because but I don't think our money laundering yeah. can really deal with whether there was some, you know, coupon privatisation yeah. 10, 15 years yeah, ago yeah. that Yeltsin regime should never have gone into. I mean, I, don't, I think there's a limit no. to how far you can go back. So there may, be, there may be bits of the British system that have not been rigorous enough, but it's not money laundering at the banks. I don't that's, think that's, so. that's and I don't think no, it's British that's, banks. That's very interesting. That is, that's very interesting. Um, banks have, though, not, have not had, they've had their fair share of scandals, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, and, and, and PPI is the consumer one, the GRG one, in which um, RBS uh, had a unit who are effectively just conflicted, massively conflicted in taking, um, admin, running, running loan books and running, buying assets effectively. Oh, I don't think that's provable, actually. Uh, the, the sort of West Register notion, which was that people bought it, that, that I do not believe. I, do, I mean, I don't believe there is any evidence, and, and the reports that have been done on it haven't found evidence, where we bought assets at an unfairly low price. We were, they were always bought when there was a, an auction, and we often bought at the best price. Uh, that was not the issue, I don't think. Uh, I think that what the reports show was uh, the reviews of this is that there were cases where we charged um, unreasonable fees 
Uh, we've actually given back a lot of that now uh, as a result of the FCA's reports into it. But, you know, people were, companies, when the, once they stopped paying interest, you know, they were then slapped with charges which they didn't really understand, which were not properly explained, uh, which actually made their position worse in some cases. I think there were examples of that. And there were probably examples of where, you know, a bit more forbearance would have perhaps allowed the company to manage its way out in a better way. And there were some fairly aggressive relationships between the bankers and companies. All of this, of course, at a time when the bank was desperately short of capital and where the sort of public rhetoric was, you know, we must make sure that the banks have got money to lend to new and promising companies and they mustn't have their money tied up with companies that are right. going so out of business. And also, just one final point on this, two-thirds of these companies were real estate. It was a real estate investment. That's basically what it was. Mm. And that, that it, you know, a lot of people got exposed in the, in the crisis with, uh, you know, real estate lending, which just went wrong. I, I don't want to have, because we don't want to have a, a wide-ranging conversation like this to get stuck into the GRG thing. But I, I, I had thought it was kind of accepted that one would call that a scandal. And is, is that, that doesn't sound like you would use that word I, to describe I wouldn't it. Use the word, I wouldn't use the word scandal. We believe that there were... Practices which were not easy to defend. We have a complaint scheme now underway with an independent High Court judge. We decided to give back £115 million pounds of, of complex fees, which was the bit that I just explained, where it's really dif difficult to defend. And there is a complaints process going through, overseen by a judge, um, and in some cases people are being paid compensation. I don't honestly think that this was a sort of systemic scandal, actually, but uh, undoubtedly there were examples of bad practice. But it was, I don't believe that there was this conflict of interest point. I've not seen proof of that. And I, 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 I don't want to, to pursue it here, be the wrong, the wrong place. But it is interesting because obviously there was PPI, the word PPI and scandal, uh, the, 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 those often go together. Yep. That's been much more expensive. I mean, that's, that's cost you five billion... Five, yes. Five billion quid. Nineteen for Lloyds. I, I wonder whether you... <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder whether... Because this was all stuff that was happening before your watch. Yeah. I, mean, I just wonder whether you have looked at how banks work and how they get themselves entangled in sort of ghastliness of that kind in which you're so obviously doing something everybody knows is inappropriate and yet... Or yeah. was it not? Again, you might say, look, it, didn't, it, 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 it was actually legitimate and it was... Well, I don't think it was exactly legitimate, but I think what you... You know, the, there's two sides of, of the PPI and the mortgages. Basically, uh, you know, if you look back, arguably, people got cheaper mortgages because they also signed up to this payment protection insurance because that's how the banks were making quite a bit of their money. Right. And if there'd been no PPI... Um, and it was a bad product, and absolutely agree with it, because it was very difficult to claim on. It was opaque. Often uh, it was sold, well, not really sold. It was just kind of packaged, and it was very hard to see what you got. Um, uh, you know, and people, most people signed up for it without even knowing they were signing up for it. It was sort of embedded in the price. But if there had been no PPI then there would have been high mortgage rates, actually, <laughs> slightly. Now, you know... Uh, so it's like lots of other of these fees. It's about price discriminating between the price-sensitive, cautious customers who know to, yeah. to get the discount and those who don't. Yeah, so you, the people who were smart were the people who said, just a minute, what's this extra mortgage, bit? Not and I won't have that. Yeah, and, and then they, they would the have low got the low-rate mortgage without, and the, without the, the PPI. The margin yes. up on the yes. side. Yeah. So that's like people who phone up the insurance company and say... Oh, it's how much to renew? Oh, you've yeah. got me a, spe a better offer. Yeah, OK. Um, we, we should talk a bit more generally about the world at the moment. In a way, you see, you might say populism, which I, I, I'm guessing you're not a fan. Uh, uh, let's see where this question is going <laughs> first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you, you, might lay the, the, you might sort of blame RBS for populism. You might blame, you might say RBS yeah. sowed the yeah. seeds of populism. Not 
not just actually, I, I, I think perhaps the most remarkable thing was, I mean, I think everybody accepted in the end, broad consensus, better to rescue RBS, even at quite a cost of the taxpayer, yeah. than to let the bank go. Not because we like the bankers, but because we like the people who put the money in the bank. I mean, there's nothing to do with saving the bankers. More interestingly, was it 2010 when the, the, the argument came out over Hester getting paid 10 million, the other bank, the other bank is saying we need we need huge bonuses, you know, million plus bonuses at a time when the bank was in its um, third year of you know big losses um, and had been bailed out by taxpayers. It would be hard not to be a member of the public, seeing the bank you have bailed out, you know, two years later, nowhere near turnaround or recovery, still paying these kind of eye-wateringly ridiculous mm. salaries. And the board saying, I'm sorry, we're all going to walk if you, don't, if you don't let us pay it up. It's an absolute principle that we have to be able to pay our people. And I just, I just wonder whether you, do, whether you would draw that line to where we got to. I'm obviously not directly to RBS, but just as people have swallowed what has happened. We are just, this is just phase two of the financial crisis, isn't it? This is the political bit of the financial okay. crisis. I think there's two, two things I'd say about that. One is that it may well be, looking back, that... If, you had, if the government had thought that the consequence of maintaining a big all-singing, all-dancing universal bank was that you had to have people who could run those and that you were going to have to pay them competitive rates, otherwise you really weren't going to succeed, and that those competitive rates were going to have very adverse political and popular consequences, maybe someone with you know, very, a lot of foresight would have said, let's not do that that actually, given that we own it, we're just not going to be able to give it the freedom to run itself that way. So that you can, I think you can argue that. And, uh, you know, that, that but it, again, that's a replaying history, but I think you can argue maybe that should have been a decision. Then the, the other point about it, RBS and, the, and populism, is that it is also true that most of the interventions in the financial sector in this country and in the US and in most parts of Europe did not in the end um, lose money. Um, you know, Lloyd's the government, well, without financing costs, but Lloyd's got, you know, yeah. government got out. Um, Northern Rock, Bradford and Bingley, you know, more or less out. The US, the TARP money got repaid. Um, they didn't rescue Lehman, of course. They got the money back in the end off AIG. So RBS is certainly one where there was, and there's going to be, I'm afraid, a net, a significant net loss for reasons we can come on to, and I delivered a lecture about it uh, a month or so ago at King's, uh, ex trying to explain why the RBS situation is different. So you can say th the fact that there is still this loss is undoubtedly a bad thing and creates a bad mood about banks still in this country. However, if you look at the countries, uh, Western countries as a whole, it's actually quite hard to see that the fact that we still had a net loss in the financial sector has had more of an impact on populist voting than elsewhere. I mean, there's some interesting analysis of uh, the sort of percentage of votes achieved by populist parties. The last election pre Lehman Brothers, which is the way this analysis is done, you know, on average it was still 3 to 5 percent in most of the countries where there were those parties. And in the first election after Lehman Brothers, it was about 10. And in the second election after Lehman Brothers, it was 15. And that's when you, if you add in the, the Finns, the Sweden Democrats, yeah. the National Front, the AFD, and all of that bunch, and you add, of course, UKIP here, and, and you can see that, that the financial crisis has produced a rise in populism. But it doesn't seem to have produced a bigger rise in populism um, because of RBS. <laughs> so, in other words, you know, it, 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 we're, we're part of it, but it's but, not, yeah. not the uniquely... Fact that we had a particularly bad financial yes. experience has not but, and I think made Really, it, you know, we just had a particularly yeah. big financial yeah, sector. Yeah. Where did um, the money go? I mean, what would... Yes. would I mean, Where did it go? Explain. Um, well, the, 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 the headline numbers are that over the last uh, 10 years, RBS has net lost about £63 billion. Pounds. That's the sort of reported losses. But the bank, the core bank, which has actually been quite successful through this period, NatWest, uh, Coots, 
you know, the sort of core parts of the bank in, domestically have made profits of 65 billion. So the net, the losses, the net losses really have been, have been 128 billion, approximately. Um, and if that so breaks... We've made, a profit, we've made a profit of 65 in the core bank, right. but which has turned into a bottom line loss of, oh, of 63. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you really, so the losses, if you like, you've, yeah, lost, yeah, 128, you've lost 128, yeah, uh, 128 yeah, billion, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, billion here, billion there. Um, where's, that, where's that gone? Uh, well, um, yeah, that's right. It's, it's, it's a lot. It's bigger than it's bigger because than you probably because you're adding the, the profit would, yeah, yeah, would yeah. have thought. Yeah, um, that is a lot. So, uh, about in, in total, about 40 billion has been on essentially loan losses. Most of that was property. 12 billion of it was in Ireland. A very material part of the bank's losses have been the fact that it was massively over lent in Ireland, the bank's market share through Ulster Bank rose dramatically in the early years of uh, this century and lost a huge amount. Uh, it lost about 30 billion on acquisitions. So, you know, what ABN, AMRO particularly, and Citizens Charter One in the US um, were ended up being worth 30 billion less than they were paid for. And that's really that you know, the ABN, parts of ABN, AMRO, that we bought um, were all of this global network which turned out to be subscale and essentially valueless. Uh, the bits of ABN that were bought by Santander and uh, Fortis were, a bit, were, were better, but the bit that we bought with a global network was, uh, was largely valueless. Then there's about... Um, 15 on conduct costs, if you like, of which five PPI was PPI, exactly. yeah. and then most of the rest was US subprime. Right. I think he's about, and he's 18, sorry, I got this. It was $5 billion dollars for subprime. Uh, no, 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 well, no, yeah, but there was others as well. We paid another yeah, $5 yeah. billion as well. We paid $5 billion every now and again. But uh, <laughs> we paid five to FHFA, that's the supervisors right. of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and then we paid five to the Department of Justice. Um, so if you take all that's about 18 billion. Yeah. And then the cost of the state aid package from Europe was much greater than was originally expected. And if you replay that, I think that it looks very unreasonable. We were required to sell Sempro as a big commodities business uh, for much less than it was eventually worth. We were required to sell WorldPay, which, mm. uh, which share price rocketed subsequently. Um, we were required to sell, uh, well, uh, the, the, the citizens, but I mean, that's, I don't want to double count those losses. Um, and we were required to dispose of 5% of market share of SME lending. That was this, what was right. going to be Williams and Glynn. Right. Okay? And when that deal was done, the bank and the commission and the treasury said, that bit will cost nothing because, you know, it'll be sold. Um, and it will be. It'll, yeah. It was done for competition purposes, not as a p punishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That exercise in, ended up costing 3.2 billion, and that in itself, which was not intended to be a penalty on the bank, um, was ended up being 3.2. And since our market cap is 28, you know that is more than 10, more than 10 percent uh, of the bank was in that requirement by the European Commission. So that roughly is where it's all gone. Um, Someone was writing that down. Well, it's that that you can, if you want, if you want <laughs> the detail, it's, I, I actually spelled it out in a lecture at King's in September, um, and uh, there are slides, and you can find it on our internet. But it is uh, we we have set it all out, and, and the real. But you know, to, to sort of forget about the individual numbers, which sound a bit confusing, is that there's also one slide which shows that there were, in the financial crisis there were a number of ways in which you could lose money. Okay. And they included making a lousy acquisition, uh, being heavily invested in property, um, you know, having uh, some uh, subsidiaries around the place uh, which you didn't properly control, um, getting involved in the US subprime market, um, and having bad conduct in LIBOR and foreign exchange. Okay? And if you, if you then analyze, and there's a nice little chart, a sort of Venn diagram chart, and you put different banks in those places, there's one that's in all of them. <laughs> Only one guess as to which that was. Right. And RBS was in every way in which you could lose money. Right. 
Look, I want to open up. I've, I've, I've already gone over that. That was particularly interesting, though. Um, let's take some questions. Howard is perfectly happy to take questions, I think, on almost anything, including airports or anything of your choice. Um, but do please talk into the microphone and please tell us who you are. It's just interesting. We've got one speaker down here. Anyone else? Any other hands, just so I can see? No, OK, go ahead. Let me take one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so Howard, so Tunde from uh, McKinsey and Company. Uh, so my question is about your, your your description of the future of the bank and it being a fintech. What do you think about market structure in ten years in terms of who's actually composing the banking sector and where the, the revenues might be sitting? Yeah, that is very that's very difficult um, because there's probably there's probably four categories. I, I haven't thought about this exactly in this way, but let's. Let's, just, let's try this taxonomy. There's the existing banks. There's exciting new fintech companies. Uh, there's the gaffers, if you like, um, or the fangs, or you know, the, you know, Googles and Alphabets and all of that. And then there's probably some people we've not heard of, <laughs> I would say. Um, um, and now, uh, for them, the big question that I do not know the answer to, and I don't think anybody does, is will at some point... Google, Amazon, Facebook decide to make the leap and actually be prepared to be a bank. At the moment, they're doing everything in financial services you can do without actually being a bank because they don't want to be regulated as banks and they think that would be very, very difficult. The question is, are they prepared to sort of stay in that, in that situation? Um, and also, are consumers prepared to allow their data to be used in the way that these companies do. I, I, I was in a group of bankers uh, a couple of weekends ago and there was a Dutch bank actually which had a fantastic ad that they used. It was all in Dutch but it was a brilliant idea and, and it was so real. They'd done, it, you know, done real live people. So they, they'd put a, a, a um, coffee van outside a station in a Dutch, I think it wasn't Amsterdam, it was some other Dutch town and it was one of those, you know, where the side lifts up and there's a cappuccino machine and, you know, cheerful guy saying hi, you know. And it's just parked outside the station, okay? And so they parked it out and they put a sign, a little blackboard saying, free coffee. And so people came out of the station and they went kind of, hmm. Some walked by and thought, it can't be true. And then some kind of came and said, is this really true? You know, is there a free, free coffee? And they said, yeah, no problem at all. What would you like, cappuccino, large one, you know, etc.? So the first one was a woman said, yeah, I thought of that. And uh, they said, is this, she said, is it really free? Yeah, they said, the only one thing is we just, we want your mobile phone and we'll plug it in and we'll just uh, take the data <laughs> off it. <laughs> and this woman said, no. <laughs> you can have my email address, she says. <laughs> and uh, and she, they said, no, 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 that's not good enough. We want all your contacts, you know. And that's essentially what you're doing. You know, when you go on to a lot of these apps, you know, that's what you're doing. That's why they're able to offer these services very, very cheaply. And yet somehow if a bank, you know, says that they'll do that or if a free coffee place, that says. And the question is, are people, you know, how are people going to think about it? Two years ago, we'd have said, ah, you know, Facebook, Google are taking all before them. And no politician was prepared to say boo to them. Now, post Cambridge Analytica, I bet you all of this in this room, you're probably all starting thinking, just a minute, you know, are we happy with this? Uh, you know, the Chancellor was prepared to stand up this week. I don't know if he knows what he's done, really, but he's the digital <laughs> services tax, and everyone goes right on. Two years ago, people were horrified by that. So what do you mean? How dare you do that? And so I think that that is that behavioural stuff as to how far people are prepared to hand over their financial details to those companies, that's a big imponderable, imponderable for me. But I suspect that they will be in chunks of the payment system. I suspect they may have to behave differently. But I think they will be there, and a lot of payments will run through those sort of retailers and social media. Yeah. Like Tesco Bank came along yeah. when Tesco were the unassailable kind of data manager of the past. That, um, but it's whether that will really become the default banking system for people, yeah. because you, if you're trading online, 
yeah, you, you, you might just feel it's the natural, yeah. the natural payment. The big, the, I was in uh, Silicon Valley uh, recently where we have offices there, actually, and uh, I was with one of the big funders, so uh, it was Andreessen, actually, who, you know, the big funders of fintech companies. And the woman there said to me, you know, the battle is joined, she said, and the quick, big question is, will the big incumbent banks get innovation before the fintech companies get customers. <laughs> um, because That's a clear way of putting they have it. got a very clear innovation, you know, they're, yeah. but it, it's customer acquisition is expensive and, and time consuming. So I think that there is basically deal to be done. I mean, that doesn't mean one deal, but a lot of, lot of deals to be done by the incumbents with the customers and the fintechs mm -hmm. trying to sort of offer more exciting services and that's essentially what our strategy is. So I think that the, those two will sort of come together and probably the big tech companies will take a big chunk of the sort of infrastructure um, and I think that's probably something we can't avoid but I doubt if they'll be prepared to go in, into being banks. I mean, so, so it's funny because actually it wouldn't make manifest sense for Monzo to be taken over by a bank, wouldn't it, with customers, wouldn't it? I, 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 the price isn't that high. And if that is... The it's quite a fancy price. Not that we've looked at it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question. Yes, we'll take the woman over here. Yep. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Margaret Cole, currently PwC and formerly of the FSA. Wow. Um, after your time, Howard, as you mm. may remember, I just wonder what, what you think the impact of the bank competition fund will be, especially as you're paying for it. You might just yeah. want to give a, a Yeah, one the sentence. bank competition fund is, and the, the bit I was referring to from the European Commission, yeah. which required us to get rid of some market share in SME lending, which was originally going to be Williams and Glynn as a separate bank, but that turned out to be technically infeasible. So instead, we have had to put £775 million into a fund to stimulate new competition in the SME banking sector. And there is now a separate organisation um, which is been, has been set up under somebody called Lord Cromwell and people are bidding for shares of that money. Hard for me to answer that question because I'm not quite sure who's bidding. We're, it's arm's length from us now. You know, we had to give the money, we wrote the cheque and then somebody else, has, we can't be involved in it. But I think that, you know, there are some interesting ideas from some of the smaller challenger banks. Um, uh, you know, they, setting up the kind of banking services that SMEs need is slightly, slightly more complicated than many people think. And, you know, it, the kinds of accounts that they need and the kind of services are more complicated and it's much harder to do that than to set up a digital number 26 bank or whatever, or Atom Bank, you know, it's harder to do that. But I suspect that there will be two or three, I think Clydesdale will almost certainly be one of them, who will use this money sensibly because they understand the market reasonably well to develop a, an interesting and competitive proposition in the SME sector. So I, we do expect that it will be effective in stimulating competition. Let me just put, ask you about Brexit because it's something that everybody thinks about here. We haven't we haven't talked about it, um, so I'd just like a, a, a visit that time. I'm telling <laughs> you, <laughs> a, a brief one on on on, on the, the risk the risk it threatens for the bank, and then a kind of a, a, a bigger one on yeah. the risk for the business community in the UK as a whole. As well, well, the bit the, the the bank bit there's two two dimensions to that. One, which is the most important by a long way, is just what it does to the British economy. Uh, because we are, you know, uh, investing in RBS or Lloyds as a leverage bet on the British economy. If the British economy goes down as a result, uh, and I think it already has gone down, relatively speaking, um, you know, then that w we suffer, and there's nothing much we can do about that. You know, we can't really hedge the British economy, if you see what I mean, you know, the, the scale that we're at. So that's by a long way the most important impact for us. The second is that we do do quite a bit of business with Western European corporates and with, uh, through the investment banking arm, um, and we are setting up a subsidiary in Amsterdam to do that, which won't be huge, probably a couple of hundred people, um, but we will have to run that uh, business through, uh, through Amsterdam. Uh, we chose Amsterdam because, well, we acquired ABN Admiral and we still have a lot of banking licenses that we could use and a good relationship with the Dutch Central Bank, etc. Uh, just, 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 you 200 there, what, 
what's the sort of gearing? You have to have that some number there, and you can have a, a number here who are doing the work they were previously doing um, on those on those contracts. Well, but actually, most of them are here, right? Uh, in <laughs> Chennai, actually, right. uh, because and and also to some extent in Delhi. Right. But um, the people who are doing the servicing um, are in uh, largely in India. So that they will be, I mean, and the people who from the London end who go to Amsterdam will be serviced still by the Indian right. operation. So we have okay. about, so about 20% of the bank's employees are in India. 20% of the employees are in India? Yeah. Goodness, I didn't realise it was that high. Um, I've been for quite a long time, and um, actually from, I mean, it was ABN AMRO's, it's one of the things we did acquire from ABN AMRO, actually, which is, was their sort of servicing centre. So that's the, that, that's the bank side of it. Yeah. What about the UK, the kind of place of the UK and the world side of it? Well, um, you know, here we are. Uh, we, we have to say these days whether... I mean, so I was a, I was a Remain uh, voter. Um, it seems to me the most persuasive analysis I have seen uh, has been the Centre for European Reform and also UBS have done this kind of synthetic UK economy and it looks like it's about 2.5% down now. So this is trying to model the UK economy and, and produce a kind of synthetic comparator. It's the kind of technique that, yeah, that yeah, companies yeah. use. You know, you, if you're a conglomerate, you, you construct a synthetic you in, and see how you're performing against it by taking bits of other companies which added together make something that like, looks like you. So we take that they have taken, UBS have taken bits of other economies and added them together and, and constructed something that performed like the UK for the last 20 odd years, okay? And then said, how does it perform, how has it performed in the last two years? And the answer is it's done two and a half percent better. I find that quite a persuasive mm -hmm. piece of analysis. So I think we've already suffered. I think how we suffer from now does depend quite heavily on a deal. You know, we know from our loan business, our business lending, that there's quite a pipeline now of people who have made sort of indicative applications for loans but who aren't triggering them because they're waiting to see what's happening. So there's quite an investment uh, pause going on at the moment. Um, and, you know, with those people basically saying to us, look, if there's no deal, you know, we're just, we're not going to go ahead, but if there is a deal and it looks sensible and, it's, you know, it gets custom, some kind of customs arrangement that looks durable, then, you know, we'll, we'll invest. So, I, it's very difficult to say anything more meaningful than that at the moment. Take a question from here. Yeah. Thank you. Rade Kuchera, Czech Embassy in London. I was wondering, something that uh, the discussion hasn't quite touched on, and I think a lot of people in the room might be asking, uh, with the turmoil in emerging markets lately, the equity valuations in the US and the happenings in the market, the late stage of the cycle, a lot of people are asking where, where from the next financial crisis might be coming. So having seen the amount of what you have seen, do you have any foresights uh, for us? RBS, where the next crisis is going to come from, it's like we use yeah. <laughs> Well, um, you know, at the moment, um, what's going on in the markets looks as if it's been a bit of a correction, which has been uh, quite a sort of healthy correction. In fact, it's come back quite a bit today again. But, I, don't quite know. but I, I, I think that, you know, there were signs that U.S. equity market valuations were remarkably high. I mean, it's amazing that, you know, the U.S. equity valuations in relation to the total world have gone up to about as high a point as they've ever been. I mean, it's unbelievable, really, to think that now, given, you know, the development of other markets. And that looks topish, you know, that looks... But at the moment, it doesn't look, to me, more like, uh, you know, more than a, than a correction. I don't, I don't see a sense of a sort of, uh, you know, collapse uh, in, in market confidence. Um, as for where the trouble may come... You know, there are undoubtedly uh, some highly indebted parts of the world economy. You know, the debt, debt in China is very high in relation, um, corporate debt in relation to GDP, I mean, much higher than it has been before. And, um, you know, there's also a lot of uh, debt in the sort of shadow banking world, which people are pretty worried about. And so 
those are the areas that, that I'd be looking at. I think the Chinese are attempting to get that debt profile down a bit and they've been putting the screws on on property lending and things like that, which I think is quite sensible. And, you know, people have lost a lot of money betting against China in the last 30 or 40 years, you know, and they've proved quite able to moderate booms and busts. But that would be the one that I'd be the most focused on rather than the, the US equity market. And that would be less the UK, that would be more... Uh, yeah, in the UK, forest. I mean, you know, I don't think the UK economy is in fantastic shape. I mean, partly, as I say, we've, lot, we've, we've grow, growing less rapidly. But also, we've got a negative savings rate, um, you know, which is not uh, a great thing. Um, and the IMF have pointed out that our balance sheet is weak. You know, our assets government and balance, government yeah, balance yeah. sheet is is unusually weak because we have large liabilities and we haven't got any big any funds built up against those liabilities and we've sold off a lot of our assets. Uh, so our the, the government's balance sheet is weak uh, by global standards. But you know, we've been somewhat cushioned by the, the falling exchange rate. Uh, I'm quite bearish still about sterling myself because I think the only way you can square this circle is probably by a further devaluation of the exchange rate. Um, but I don't see the UK as being uh, the sort of s the epicentre of a new financial crisis. I think that'll be elsewhere if it comes. Geopolitical risks? I mean, US-China, mm. very big thing at the moment, isn't it? Is that, is, is that behind some of the market moves or maybe it's a trigger rather than a cause? Uh, yeah, it's very, it's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, it, it seems to me that the moment... Trump seems to be like the tiresome bloke in the bar who goes around kind of provoking people and causing trouble, saying, oh, I don't like that suit, mate, you know, <laughs> and relies on the fact that you will say, you'll just kind of go, okay, and just, you know, yeah. carry on with your drink and not react. Um, and, and that, you know, at the moment, that's what seems to be happening, that he sort of pushes, you know, the Canadians and the Mexicans and the Chinese, and it relies on the fact that other people kind of go, okay, fine, but let's not get overreact, let's just try and do a deal, etc. Yeah. And, you know, you, th th but that's a curious behaviour in a way, isn't it, in terms of trade uh, negotiation. So it does create a nervousness, although each time so far, you know, the, the I mean, NAFTA has been restored in some fashion, you know, NAFTA, it's, yeah, it's gone. It's not worked with the Chinese. And it hasn't yet, 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 it hasn't yeah, yet yeah. worked with the Chinese. But it's not great that you rely on other people kind of swallowing and not reacting. Um, and so it, it does create nervousness, but um, I don't know what more I can say about it. Yeah, no. Another question. Yeah, we'll take the uh, gentleman in red at the back there. Yep. Hi, um, Munif from UCL. Um, I just wanted to ask, what, what do you think um, a future Labour, Labour government could hold for um, RBS and the... UK financial sector, especially with um, more recent comments by the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown saying he'd, he hoped that um, when he was in power he used the, that he would have used the UK Fraud Act to prosecute bankers for the financial crisis. And now we've seen Labour saying they want to go after um, capital in, the, in these areas. What do you think um, well, Have Labour said something specifically, apart from Gordon Brown, about locking up or trying to get yeah, well, Gordon that. Brown said he wishes he'd used, he wishes he'd he used no, no, the... But, but has, has, the, has Corbyn's Labour Party said they would? Well, they no. haven't, but they've said they want to go after the sector, which has made it kind of right. nervous. Yeah. They've no, been, I mean, clearly they're, they're they've been a bit vague about that. They're not dewy-eyed about the, 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 the city, mm. let's be honest. No. Um, yeah. So this is the okay. Corbyn well, question. Two, two, well, two things. One on the other one. I mean, I, you know, I heard what Gordon Brown said, but, you know, the... <coughs> the Normally, if you want to convict people of a crime, they have to have done a crime, you know. And, um, uh, and I, I think that, that this r sort of rhetorical notion that um, the criminal law should be used, I mean, where the criminal law has been attempted to be used, it's not been very successful because, um, you know, you have to prove uh, beyond reasonable doubt, etc. And you've seen the recent collapse in the foreign exchange trial in the U.S., uh, that's a slightly peculiar because the banks kind of put their hands up and paid up. And now the individuals who were the reason why the banks paid up are being let off. Now, which is the more effective? You know, if there'd been a criminal action against 
the leaders of the banks, okay, the banks would have then had to say, well, we can't possibly settle and, and, until that criminal action has been done. And the criminal action would have failed because if they couldn't get the traders, they'd never have got the CEOs. So we'd never, we wouldn't have paid at all, I think. So I think it's a very I mean, peculiar it's argument. Possible, it's possible juries would be more sympathetic of the CEO, uh, of convicting CEOs right. than trade. The, the public sort of feel the traders are just small pawns of a system that is led by people. Well, it's, well, yeah, but it looks as if, I mean, the arguments in the case seem to be, well, you do, could you really prove that this action that resulted in that consequence? And you'd find it even much more difficult to prove it from the, from the, from the CEOs. So anyway, that, but that's, that's uh, I think that's rather sort okay, of... Okay, so then the, but what about the general Labour, the, general point, the, the general point, well, you asked specifically your beginning of your question, you said, what has Labour got for RBS? Well, there is a paper uh, published by somebody called GFC Economics, which McDonnell has said he supports, um, which says that they, it, this is the paper that uh, recommends that the Bank of England should be sent to Birmingham, and um, that there should be one deputy governor who is responsible for productivity. So this is the notion that the Bank of England should have a productivity target as well as an inflation target, that the bank should be aiming to achieve productivity increases of 3% a year. And there's one deputy governor who would be responsible for that and for inflation and whose tools would be interest rates and capital weights and directed lending and would be responsible for telling the banking system to lend to this sector and not to that sector. And you would get l different capital weights um, which would incentivize lending to particular favored sectors based on an analysis of what would improve productivity. And then in that paper it says that RBS, if RBS is still in public ownership, undefined, we are still majority the public is owned. Twenty four uh, now to get yes. to get you out completely but, but out. Completely yeah. out, but we're at sixty two percent. That RBS would be the lending arm for this policy. But if it was not in public ownership by that time, then a separate lending right. mechanism would be created. That is what has been said. Okay. I think that's the guy called Graham Turner, who you yes, yeah, yes. who used to work for a Japanese bank actually through some yeah. through the the difficult years for Japanese banks. He yeah. was working in Japan and then went and set up. Now, this. since that since that paper was published, the the question has been asked as well. You know, does that mean that the Labour Party would take the rest of RBS back into public ownership? They've been silent on that point. That's not been mentioned, and the. You know, the nationalisations that were referred to in the party conference were all, you know, like uh, water and uh, railways and stuff. So, and, I, I, and we've not heard that they have any intention of buying back the 38% they don't own. So I, I, that's as much as I can, there's as much as I can tell you. It's, a bit, it's not totally clear. There's also a slight difficulty about whether you could really do that with a bank that was partly privately owned and partly publicly owned. Because I have a feeling that to tell RBS to lend on a non-commercial basis, if you like, um, and it, almost by definition it would be a non-commercial basis because otherwise we'd lend to these people anyway, wouldn't we? So, uh, you know, whether you could do that with, uh, with the interests of the minority yeah, share minority shareholders yeah. would, would, would say, excuse me, I don't think we can do that unless you indemnified the bank in some way. So that's also a possibility. But I'm afraid there's a lot of uncertainties, but that is the, the, the answer to your question. And if you, if you want to know more about it, there's a paper by GFC Economics called Investing in the UK or something like that. And the bits that have been attracted attention have been, you know, moving the Bank of England to Birmingham, the productivity target and that. But this kind of flows out of it. Uh, uh, there's a question being asked of business people, are you more scared of Brexit or Corbyn? And I mean, there's a sort of, it's, it's not obvious what, what answer you're going to get. Um, no, what they're really scared about is Brexit, then Corbyn. I think that's the... <laughs> <bit>. <coughs> okay, we've got time for probably another question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap and have a drink. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. But just just let, let, let the mic come, because it's all being... Uh, 
Hi, Secretary, Citibank, Treasury, and uh, foreign markets. Um, but um, what's your thoughts, sort of, David, sort of, uh, on the uh, banking without borders, like cryptocurrencies and things, and which way, uh, you know, uh, banking without uh, borders and regulations? What's your thoughts on that, and how is that moving with this blockchain technology? Yeah. Um, well, I am not uh, a bull of <laughs> cryptocurrencies, uh, which seem to me not to fulfill really any of the functions of money. Um, you know, they're not certain in valuation terms. It's very expensive to transact. Um, uh, and uh, so I have been quite pleased, frankly, by the sort of cryptocurrency bust. So that's one thing. Um, the blockchain technology is interesting and does have, I think, some uh, utility. And uh, indeed, we, um, we do use it a, a, in, in a small way. Uh, as probably, and I think Citibank do too in various different ways. But it, it is expensive uh, to use. I mean, you know, it's sort of curious and it's environmentally unfriendly as well. But I think that there is something in the notion of a distributed ledger in certain circumstances which can make sense. I mean, actually, we use it at the moment in things like regulatory reporting, interestingly, you know, where, you know, all the banks. Um, at, report mortgage volumes and things and there's a kind of blockchain thing which allows you to do all of that and, and allows this data to be sort of agglomerated and can't be fiddled around with any and the FCA quite like that. So, so I think there are, there are utilities, um, useful functions for blockchain technology particularly if it could be made somewhat uh, cheaper but I think that in my mind is separate from the specifics of cryptocurrencies which I'm not enthusiastic about. Any last questions for Howard? No. Well, I think we should, uh, we should draw to a close. We've run, run a little bit late there. Um, Howard, just on the sort of airport side, because I, I, this was quite a big part of your life, airports. Some would say it's a kind of an analogy for the paralysis of the company. You know, the, the yeah. weak leadership is, 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 is something people worry about in politics in Britain at the moment. We're paralysed on Brexit. We're still arguing about what it means. And we're now sort of weeks away from having to, to, to implement it. Um, but where are you on airports now? Are you, 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 you recommended third runway at yeah, Heathrow. Is, runway, is, is, yeah. the, 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 and the, and uh, this prime minister, to her credit, eventually decided um, that she would do it, even though uh, she had a constituency uh, issue fine. from uh, Maidenhead, and as her constituency is not enthusiastic about it, but she decided that it was the logical answer. In my view, it's more important to get a on with it now than it was pre the referendum because you know if you looked at all the various surveys about London um, before the referendum sort of why people were invested here and why people came here with their banks etc there was you know um, there were lots of things people love about London the theatres and all of that and of course the access to the European market and there were lots of things people didn't like but they kind of lived with them and, you know, congested airspace and congested Heathrow and all of that was something which was regarded as, oh, you know, that's just part of the deal. London's hugely successful and we can kind of live with that. I think if you're in a circumstance where one of your big strengths has actually been kicked away, then I think these other things are even more important than they were before. Because if you, you know, and, and also this sort of rhetorical uh, flourish about our wanting to uh, explore new global markets, global blah, market. blah. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, it's not particularly persuasive if you can't actually get a flight there um, <laughs> because we have no capacity at either Heathrow or Gatwick at the moment. So I think it's actually even more important. And also, you know, I think it would be it's a 15-ish billion pound project largely funded by overseas investors. I think it would have a signalling effect which would be quite powerful as well that people were prepared to put their money down for London. So it seems to me in all kinds of ways it actually is much more significant as a project than it was uh, even three years ago. Where it is, is that the government, you know, there's always been a majority in Parliament in favour of it. Peculiarly, under the last one, there was sort of leaderships were not in favour, but the majority of MPs are. And actually, you know, they, there was a big majority in favour of it huge, when they had majority. A, but it's the courts where it'll get caught up in next, yes. and then... The big issue is air quality, um, which uh, has become more salient than it was at the beginning of the exercise, where people were more concerned about noise. I think it's air quality that's the big thing. Uh, but I personally think that's achievable. I think that 
it, you have to be pretty aggressive on how you get to airports because the problem Heathrow's got with air quality is that it's in a bad neighbourhood. You know, with the M25 here and the M4 there, and Heathrow's kind of stuck there. And a lot of the air pollution around Heathrow is actually just because of where it is. Now, in some ways, actually, this is quite rational to put all your kind of polluting things in one place, you know, who wants to live there, really, sort of thing. But on the other hand, you know, you can't just condemn the people who are there to... Uh, but, but what you really need to do is very aggressive moves uh, on it's the way people get to the airports. Airport. Kiss and fly's got to go. And, um, you know, I, I, and I, I think a congestion charge around the airport. But I think that the, the, you know, the importance of Heathrow, the sort of connectivity of Heathrow is such that I think people would get used to it. You know, people have got used to the congestion charge in London. Is it controversial now? We are, by the way, going to move to non fueled car, non petrol cars. So that will make a big gonna make, yeah, It's going to make a very big plus to big the difference. air quality. So right. I think uh, over a period, I, I, think it, I think that sort of problem can be solved. Um, and I think it should go ahead, and I think it probably will. But there's still be some. It, 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 it's a long, yeah. tortuous runway. Mm. Well, you get, a, you get a, a drift of the expansive interests of uh, Howard from this briefish conversation. Um, thank you all for, for coming along, but I think we primarily should express our thanks to Sir Howard himself. Thank you very much. And if, um, if you're not overly poisoned by the air, you can go and poison yourself with a drink, a, a red wine or a white wine upstairs. Thanks. <laughs>